Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. It's nice to be here in person. I think last year I had to do this beamed aboard, um, so it's really nice to be here in person for a day. This is great. Um, as Vivek said, and um, you're going to talk about a lot of areas of uh, how we improve health. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit biased as the Director of Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research at the NIH, um, but um, the data also supports it. Um, over half of uh, premature deaths are the result of social and behavioral factors. Um, and so I am very happy, Vivek was just asked me about my back surgery, I'm really happy that people do research and back surgery and pain meds and all those sorts of things. But at the end of the day, the things that really sort of drive health are things like tobacco and alcohol and drugs and sex and rock and roll, et cetera, et cetera. You know the routine. Okay. So um, I'm going to take you on a quick historical bet first. Um, and um, it's great to be um, sort of the lead off hitter before Donna and Bonnie come on, um, who are great at this. And I, I told them I didn't, I just want to try to set the stage and let them sort of go into the depth a bit more. This is, I just want to put us in historical perspective for a second. This is a paper that I wrote in 2013 because I got tired of hearing people ask me, where is all this empirical research on mobile health? And I said, well, there's not any because it takes so long to do research, right? So this was just a, this was, I think we published it in 2013, but the point was at the end of 2012, when you analyzed and published your study, um, if you were started that process back in 2006 with a grant award, you didn't even know what an iPhone was, at that point, right? It hadn't even come about. None of these other projects, none of the other things that came along after that point. And it continues to be that way, right? Right now we're in the problem of sensor technologies and how long it takes for us to get the, the information out on that. Um, and I think there's a lot of things that we're gonna to need to do about how we speed up our research process and do that more quickly than we're able to do right now to be able to address that. Just to give you a sense, um, if you just look at M Health in PubMed by year, um, nobody starts really publishing and using that terminology until 2010. Um, that's how quickly, and look at the explosion that's happened in PubMed as a result of that. Now, I can't put mobile health in there, um, because when you do, um, everybody who drives an x-ray machine over to a community um, to do TB screenings and that sort of thing gets included in mobile health. So it looks like we did some really interesting mobile health in the 1950s, but um, it was because of that, not because of anything else. Um, and the grant awards in M Health or Mobile Health by Year have also um, expanded as well and increased over time, um, and pretty good bumps along the way um, as they go forward. Um, so it's been, it's been a good increase in the amount of funding that goes into that um, as we go along, um, and that continues to be the case. But of course, this stuff existed before um, there were smartphones, um, that mobile health was along for a long time. Uh, these are just some examples from my work in the early days. Believe it or not, this Caltrack up in, we did accelerometers for many, many years, right? So Caltrack up in the upper corner um, actually tried with some uh, with press patients on inpatient unit to see if I could track psychomotor retardation using those things. You won't see an article about it because it's just bomb, just abysmally. So that didn't work at all. Uh, this is some handheld units that we made in, uh, when I was in the private sector to sort of do scheduled gradual reduction of smoking. Once again, not a bad idea until people started doing smoking bans and then prompting people to smoke in the middle of the places where they were and they couldn't smoke, didn't work very well. So that doesn't work anymore. Um, you'll find at a certain point in your career you go, well, there's a whole bunch of stuff I did that just really doesn't that really that useful anymore. But hopefully it built on other things. We used to do college, uh, we started text messaging for smoking cessation, still actually um, a really strong literature on that. Uh, Free did a really nice large scale study and a couple of Cochrane reviews to show that actually there's a pretty good effect um, for smoking cessation. And then uh, Bonnie particularly and Donna and others have worked on PDA based uh, dietary assessment evaluation programs as well. Um, and that's back when PDAs meant personal digital assistant and not uh, um, what, what are the, Public displays of, uh, okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah. that. Um, okay, I wanted to quickly take you through this. Uh, Vexal Research mentioned this a bit. Um, there were two things that started to happen at the NIH that got us thinking about the need for a summer training institute. One of them was the Gene Environment and Health Initiative. And one of the nice things about the GEI project was that um, in addition to looking at genetic tools and technologies, there was a real need to look at environmental tools and technologies as well. Could we measure in better ways than we currently are able to environmental um, 
impacts on health and disease. Um, and so there were a number of groups doing this. This was the tools to measure exposure of psychosocial stress and addictive substances. And you'll recognize the guy down at the bottom of the list. Um, so he was one of the people bouncing around during that time. Um, and as he said, at one of the follow-up meetings, I think toward the end of the project, um, is when we first had some discussions about um, a mHealth uh, summer training institute for people. The other thing that happened about that same time, uh, Audi Atenza and Wendy Nielsen and I said, we ought to have an mHealth um, interest group in mobile health um, and pull some people together at the NIH that are beginning to kind of look at this and see what they think and that sort of thing. Um, and part of what grew out of that were these mHealth summits. Now, um, if you look at the summit nowadays, it looks a lot like the computer, computer like, or consumer electronics show um, for mobile health. Uh, but in the early days, it was really, this, the first one was a combination of the foundation of NIH and Microsoft Research um, that put it together. Um, we had um, some reasonable dignitaries in the first one. Francis Collins was actually quite new to the NIH at the time, so he was one of the speakers. A couple of people from the CDC and other places along the way. So it was a good group. Um, and then 2010, I think it was Bill Gates actually spoke at that one. So it was, you know, a pretty interesting group of people. And, and what part of it was the excitement around this new technology and what it could do for us, right? And the things that were possible. And I will say right now, before we get into the rest of this history, there, the paradigmatic shift, and I don't use that par paradigm shifting very often in science, but there's a possible paradigmatic shift that's happening as a result of these technologies, right? Our ability to change the way we assess behavior and assess it over time and assess it intensively and assess it more objectively um, has, is really going to change if it hasn't already begun to change the science as we move forward. And the same thing is true of dissemination and implementation and outreach of our interventions. Um, almost all behavioral interventions are very time intensive. They're very resource intensive. They take a lot of time and effort to do. Um, and the ability to have reach and scalability and some degree of treatment fidelity, assuming that bugs don't enter into our system and blow things up, um, is actually a pretty nice thing to have that is difficult to do. Um, so around the end of those two things, around uh, like a, the winter before this summer, uh, which was the first mHealth Summit, Wendy Nielsen on the left came to me and said, I think we ought to have an mHealth Summer Training Institute. I said, that's a great idea. We should set that up for 2012. And she said, no, 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 this summer. I want to do it this summer. There's, and there's no way in hell you're going to do that in six months. Um, sure enough, uh, she did it in six months. Um, uh, Eric was one of the first. I'm trying to think of other people. There's probably other faculty in the room were in the first. My student. Were you a student? Yes, he was your student. I think. Um, so. Oh, yeah, he's now I'm his student. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah. So that's that's how all this got started back then, and, and fairly quickly. And at the in the early stages of this, um, it was done by uh, contract um, and support by OBSSR. And then when we came up with the R25 mechanism, we spun it out. That. Oh yes, and Qualcomm and some other groups as well. There are a lot of people who supported this in the early stages. Um, and UCA, UCLA is a very nice place, but this first one was in La Jolla. So that was kind of a nice spot too. Um, but I'm supposed to be talking about unpacking the black box of behavior change. So let me, let me focus on that for a little bit. Um, where I live in the world of biomedical people, um, I always have to remind people that common sense has led us astray. Um, and that if you use common sense for behavior change, you're probably gonna get yourself in trouble. Um, so in the natural sciences, you know that, right? The earth is flat. Earth is the center of the universe. Um, it's a static and steady state universe as opposed to ever expanding and actually inflationarily expanding. Um, all those things are different now than what your common sense would tell you from your experience. Biological and medical science is the same way. Um, the illness were the results of bad humors or satanic forces or something like that. Um, and there was certainly enough data to support that, at least anecdotally, as you look at people and how they behave and the things that happen to them. Or that sugar makes kids hyperactive, despite the fact that that's clearly not the case in most studies or that cracking your knuckles will give you arthritis, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't do that at all. And the one that will scare many of you in this room, organic foods are really no more nutritious than regular foods are, um, by many, many studies. You still want to eat organic foods, knock yourself out, but the data does support it from a nutritional point of view. Okay, 
And then here's the problem for behavioral people. Everyone's a behavioral theorist. Every single one of us, no matter who you are, your brain evolved to be able to predict, to react to, and to regulate the environment around you. And that includes you and everybody around you as well. Um, so we're all, this is what, from the time you were born, actually from your prenatal self, you did this, right? You reacted to, predicted, and ultimately tried to regulate the world around you. Um, and then you go, well, that's great then. We should all be great behavioral scientists as a result. Well, no. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is that even though our brains are just amazing Bayesian calculators and do things extremely well, they're frequently wrong. Right? And they're wrong in two ways. One is that our theories that are based on our own personal experience don't generalize well to other people. Right? That's been our problem of, let's bring all the previous alcoholics in to do Alcoholics Anonymous and all kinds of other kind of alcoholic um, treatment. They kind of run from their own personal experience of what helped them, but that might not necessarily be what's going to help other people along the way. And the other is because our brain just uses an immense amount of energy, it's got to take shortcuts. I mean, otherwise your brain would explode and blow up and all those other things would happen to it. But it doesn't, and it doesn't because we do lots of cognitive heuristics, lots of shortcuts, so we can get to the point really quickly. The result of that is that we tend to be personality theorists, dispositional theorists. We tend to assume that if a person is a certain way, they're a certain way, and that's the way they're going to behave, and that's the way they're always going to behave, and there's not a lot of difference in that. Of course, what the research shows is that situational environmental factors account for a lot more of your behavior than do your personality dispositional factors. So yet, once again, another common sense thing that's gone wrong. Um, I love this one because we would all be Nobel Prize winners if we had it. Um, if people knew the right thing to do, they would do it. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people still believe that. Now, you look at it and go, well, of course that's not true, but people still do that. Anger management training. Right? Or I get a DUI. I didn't, I didn't get a DUI. <laughs> Let's say I got a DUI. I, I would go to um, training, right, for uh, vehicle, motor vehicle training about that. Like, like as if I didn't know that drinking excessively would be bad for my driving, right? It's, it's not a knowledge-based issue, yet we still treat these things as if that's the case. Uh, but people will make rational economic decisions. Our behavioral economist friends have pointed out that that's not necessarily the case. Um, I love this one from the old um, bystander apathy research, right, that if more people are around, the more they'll help you. Uh, it turns out that's not the case. Um, you're better off with just one or two people standing nearby. Um, I don't know how much time I have to tell stories. Let me make sure. <laughs> um, one of, no, no, no. One of my first jobs was um, a graduate student, uh, was a social psychologist who was doing bystander apathy research, and one of them had to do with um, whether how much danger you were involved in made a difference. And this is back in the day of big mainframe computers and cables that ran across the floor and that sort of thing. So as people came up, now of course we can't do this any, risk research anymore, right, because it's, uh, it's you know, deceptive. But in the day we used to do this kind of research. And in some cases I was laying on the floor, like passed out, but not laying on top of the electric cables. And in others I was laying on top of the electric cables. And so it was like, would people help me? And whether you know the amount of threat of danger made a difference. Well, it turned out one guy decided that the best way to get me off the cables was to kick me off the cables. <laughs> um, so one crack and rib later, um, I didn't I didn't um, work for that professor anymore. Um, I found other ways to make money in graduate school as well. Um, people learn better if they're taught their preferred learning style. Um, Educational um, folks uh, will time and again come up with these sort of common sense sort of things that in the end of the day, the empirical data doesn't make the case. Thinking good about yourself will make you feel better about yourself. That's the Stuart Smalley um, perspective, those of you who remember some old Saturday Night Live ones. Um, but anyway, I, I do that and then go, nobody remembers that. Why I come up with these things from the past? Um, and then telling people how bad drugs are for them will deter them from using them. This is a particularly bad one right now. We're in the middle of an opioid crisis. We have 50 or 60 plus studies in substance abuse prevention programs that are effective, that work, that do what they're supposed to do. And in most communities in the world today, people still teach to, uh, substance abuse prevention by saying, you know, drugs are really bad for you and they'll hurt you in all these following ways. And as a result, you shouldn't do them. Um, and, and then we end up with the problems that we have with substance abuse as a result. Okay. 
So in, trying to, in terms of thinking like a behavioral scientist, some of you are, some of you aren't. And this would probably, again, be more my way of thinking as a behavioral scientist, so keep that in mind. I don't know how much this will generalize. We'll see after I do this presentation. Um, by definition, the gut reaction of a good behavioral scientist is to question every commonsensical idea out there. Right? That, oh, oh, really? Well, that's interesting. How do you know that? Where does that come from? Um, where, what's the data to support that? Um, it will get you in trouble on occasion. I've had situations where I've questioned the common sense of people and been shouted down for questioning their common sense, but that's one of the things you want to try to do. Embrace the counterfactual, the null hypothesis. This, this can't be true. Let's, let's prove it. Let's see if that's going to be the case. And test our hypotheses very, via empirical approaches, and then just passionately and objectively interpret the findings. That last one we don't do very well. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have passion for your science, right? But you should be willing to live with the, the opposite idea in the opposite direction. Um, some of uh, my political science colleagues, and I deal with them some when I'm working with the National Science Foundation, have this issue and have this problem, right? Can they be dispassionate and objective about their science without taking a liberal or conservative bent to their views and doing it? All right, so before I get into some just quick, very quick things about how behavioral interventionists think, uh, let me stop here and just say, I'm gonna talk about intervention for about three or four minutes, but don't forget the measurement component of this, right? Lord Kelvin said that the greatest advances in science come because of advances in measurement. Uh, whether that's the electron uh, microscope or the telescope or whatever it happens to be, it was those advances in measurement that then led us to advances in science. And the advances in measurement that we now get from sensor technologies and smartphones and that sort of thing will lead us in places we have never been before and help us to understand people in ways we've never understood them before. That's a very critical aspect of this. Um, it is essentially direct observation without all the mess of having to do that. In, in graduate school, in addition to getting kicked in the ribs, um, I, I, work, I had to work through graduate school. So I, I counted the number of times one kid hit another on the playground classroom. I counted the number of pills left over in the pill box as people came here. I counted lots of stuff, right? That was my job coding and counting and doing direct observation. Um, we now can make that an automated process and do it in more intensively than any person with a pencil and paper coding could ever have done. Um, that's gonna really change the way we do research in the future and already has. So how behavioral interventionists think um, by Bill Riley. <laughs> so, um, for any given behavior, this could be physical activity, it could be smoking cessation, take your pick, whatever those happen to be. One of the first things you've got to think about is what influences that behavior? What drives it? What moves it? What changes it over time, right? Um, and again, if you do this via an empirical approach, you're going to start looking at what does the data tell me about what influences that behavior? So I put partial R squares up there because the tendency is for people to use um, structural equation modeling or other types of latent modeling to be able to determine how does this influence at time one affect this behavior at time two. Um, so it's at least one of the ways to do that, but there are certainly others, to be able to understand how various sort of behaviors, um, what influences them and how are they influenced. Some of those are internal, like self-efficacy as an example. They're sort of your confidence and one's belief being able to do something, or they might be external. They may be um, environmental barriers or the reinforcement, reward systems in the environment, that sort of thing that are driving that. Whatever that is, you've got to be able to first think about that. And what is this you want to target? Um, uh, Melissa's here. The Science of Behavior Change Group has done a really nice job of trying to get us to think more. And I don't think we ought to think more like the bi biomedical folks, but I think it's important that we we're able, going back to the point about being transdisciplinary, that we're able to cross over our language. So they talk about these as targets and assays. We talk about them as mechanisms or mediators or those types of things. In the grand scheme of things, they're the things that influence the behavior. Okay? And we want to pick the ones that have the most influence, right? Why target something that has very little influence? Social cognitive theory, for instance, says that your perceived, the perceived outcomes that you have about engaging a behavior will somehow change your behavior. The, almost every study shows that the partial correlation for that is, is really quite small, is really quite small. And so why would you target and spend a lot of time on perceived outcomes when in reality it really doesn't influence behavior that much anymore? 
The other thing, and this goes back to the point about us being able to measure things intensively over time, is that most of our research on this is looking at what's different between people and how it influences their behavior. It's not in what changes within a person over time that influences those behaviors. And being able to do that is going to be a big change in the way we do work. Okay. And then you got to figure out how to change those things, right? Um, so in this case, it's the, you know, whether it's setting small goals for people so they can build their self-efficacy gradually over time, or modeling self-efficacy as they move forward, reducing barriers um, in the environment, uh, or increasing cues and rewards, right? Those are just a couple examples. And again, this is a very simplistic system, right? It could be a lot more complicated than this. It could have feedback loops and probably should, and the things are kind of working with each other along the way. But you begin to kind of structure a way in which you've got, these are the things that are most likely to change these influences of behavior, and these are the things that are the biggest influencers of that behavior moving forward. That's the way that I think most interventionists tend to think as they move through this work. Okay. Um, and a few words about methods. I'm bouncing all over the place today, but that's, I, this is what you get to do when you're like the lead author. Bitter. You get to do whatever you want at the home plate. Um, so, leveraging mobile and sensor data for assessing behavior and its influence we've already talked about. Taking advantage of the temporally dense data available to us. Um, our analytic approaches are getting better and better at this, but I will confess that in my early stages of doing this work, I took in continuous data and I went, this is pre, this is mid, this is post, this is follow-up, right? And just average them together. And lost all the variability and all the things that go on in that work. Um, Align at comparative to the research question. This, I will tell you, as pet peeves go, this is one of mine, which is to read mobile health intervention research where they haven't really thought through the comparator. Are you comparing the device and the delivery method? Are you comparing differences in content? Are you comparing things that you can deliver via mobile devices that you can't deliver via traditional? Like, what is your comparator? Or is it some, are you trying to isolate and manipulate one aspect of the intervention? It never gets very clear and we end up, and again, I'll confess I did the exact same thing. I would throw, well, let's do a self-help version of that. Well, no one does a self-help version of it, right? But that was my comparator in some ways because it was easier and I was likely to get a big delta and so that would give me another grant. But in the grand scheme of things, we ought to be a lot more thoughtful about our comparators. Um, and remember this, it's not about the platform or the content, it's about the person and the time and the context and the state that there has to be in the design. As behavioral, scientists, our tendency is to believe greatly in the interventions that we develop and produce, um, and probably not enough acknowledgement that at any one point in time, that might work for that person now, might not work for them later, might work again for them three years from now, and might work in different contexts and different environments. Um, okay. And then I, I'll stop with a few words about OBSSR. So, um, we're a coordinating office of the NIH. Um, if you ever get lost trying to figure out how to navigate the NIH, we're one of the places you can stop and say, I don't even know where to go. I don't even know which institute would probably take this. Um, and our job is to help sort of regulate that and make that work. Um, and then, um, and so if you really need some sleep on a given night, you can always read that strategic plan um, as a way to do that. <laughs> Um, and along the way, we've um, helped sort of lead and co-sponsor some of the uh, larger projects um, of the NIH in the mobile technology space. Um, uh, the mobilizing research one is um, Eureka is up and running and rolling, right, Richard? We're in pretty good shape there. So people can actually access it and use it as a test bed for uh, evaluating mobile technologies and new interventions that you have developed. Uh, we probably will come out with something a little different than this revision applications for validation of mobile and wireless. Um, the thought there was is that people are doing research already and they're using whatever the current state of the art is. Yet a newer sensor technology or newer approach, could you just lay that on top of what you're already doing in the study? Uh, we may do that in a slightly different way in the next version that comes out. Um, and then when we're going to fund fairly soon on intensive longitudinal analysis of health behaviors, so um, as we get closer to that. So those are some of the photos that we've got. Um, that's all my contact information. You know where I am. You know where to find me. The NIH is pretty open about where we are, so just shoot me an email, ask me a question, and I am two minutes over time, so I'll stop. Thank you all. <laughs>